Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with special guests, Dr. Raymond Moody and Lisa Smart. And they're here to share with us the afterlife and the University of Heaven. Now, Dr. Moody coined the term near-death experience in his book, Life After Life. For half a century, Dr. Moody has researched some of life's greatest mysteries. As both a Ph.D. in philosophy and M.D., Dr. Moody has had a strong interest in how medical realities intersect with the effective realms of philosophy. In his multiple roles of author, professor, public speaker, and grief counselor, he has heard thousands of accounts of near-death, shared death, and after-death experiences. Lisa Smart is a linguist, educator, and poet. She's the author of Words at the Threshold, What We Say When We're Nearing Death. We had her on the show about a year ago to talk about this book, and it is absolutely amazing. The book is based on Data Collect Through Final Words Project, which is an ongoing study devoted to gathering and interpreting the mysterious language at end of life. She has worked closely with Dr. Raymond Moody, guided by his research into language, particularly unintelligible speech. So let's welcome to the show Dr. Raymond Moody and Lisa Smart. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us on today. What a deep honor it is to have the both of you here. My goodness, Lisa, we had you on, gosh, a couple years ago to talk about your book and how heartwarming that is. And to have Dr. Moody here, ooh, I'm so excited. (laughs) (laughs) So I have to ask, how did the two of you start working together? Wow. Do you want to go ahead, Raymond? Well, I... um... I, you know, although I'm I'm kind of known um, for my near death work uh, and the Life After Life book, um, as I said in Life After Life, my background was I, I'm a philosophy professor, and before I went to medical school, and um, I'm interested in logic and philosophy of language, and. Um, so really, what was in the background of my writing of Life After Life was my interest in language, because as I said at the very beginning, um, what we're really dealing here with is narratives. I mean, you don't, you can't observe the actual experience. So all, what you have to study is the narratives that people give you. And I mean, I think language is really essential, and you can't really think about these um near-death experiences unless you take that into account. So um, I have been interested since I was literally a kid in nonsense in the sense of Dr. Seuss and Lewis Carroll and so on. And, um, you know, people with near-death experiences, the most common thing they tell you is that no matter how articulate they might be. Um, they say you just can't put it into words. So I am, I've been very interested in uh, the last communications of people as they pass away often sound nonsensical to us. And uh, if you ask the relatives who are left behind, they say, yeah, just before he died or the last few weeks of her life, she was talking nonsense. And yet the people were very moved by it. Like, Somewhere in the back of my mind, as, as one philosopher, uh, as professor of religious studies told me, who, whose um, husband had died, in the last few days he was talking nonsense, and she was very impressed by this because she felt that it had a sort of meaning. So I was talking about this some years ago, um, and uh, up bounced uh, my friend Lisa, who who had been ob- observing that very phenomenon in, in her, her father who had died a little while before. And so that's what got us together. But I think there's just a natural kind of um, uh, camaraderie here that we've always felt. Well, you know, for me, um, I had a background in linguistics. And uh, I never imagined I would be working with Dr. Raymond Moody. I knew his book. I mean, it came out when I was 17. It was a sensation uh, for in my community of of people. Um, 
And, but what happened is when I heard my father's language shift in the, especially the last three weeks of his life, I was really intrigued by what I heard. And uh, just synchronistically, my mother had a friend who was teaching a workshop with Raymond in Alabama. And I thought, well, what the heck, you know, let me see what this man knows about final words, because I heard things from my father that intrigued me profoundly, and I couldn't find answers to some of the questions I had about what I heard from my dad in those final weeks. And as a linguist, I noticed very specific changes in the language. So I went to this workshop, and there he was um, talking about his interest in, in, in narrative and how difficult it is to speak about some of these experiences people have as they cross the threshold or after they've crossed the threshold. And so um, the moment I heard that he had that interest, I thought, oh, my God, what an honor it would be to work with him and learn from him. And, uh, and I've been fortunate to, to have done that in the last six years or so. Yeah, let me say, I think, I mean, this is what Lisa is doing, She's, which is something I had always been interested in. But there's only so many things you can study, if you know what I mean. I have a lot of things I'm working on and that she came in and she's done this really phenomenal work, which she reports in her book, Words at the Threshold, where she is seeing the structures of um, the communications, the linguistic communications of people in their last few days and hours and minutes of life. And, um, you know, this is just very important because I am really confident that um, once we kind of see what the structure of that language is, that that we will be able to sort of determine the point, ultimately, I think, where people in their dying process flip over to another state of existence. I, I think this, this work is, um, in my opinion, this is what's happening now in near-death studies. Well, and it's such, it's on the leading edge of this frontier that you both are really kind of these, these travelers on that you're taking us with you on this journey, which I'm so appreciative of because there are things that are being said in those final moments, I've had a few friends pass over the last few years. And, you know, one talked about how her, her past dog was there with her mm-hmm. and, you know, and that she would be leaving soon. And it was very different in how she said that from all the rest of the time when she was going through the death process. Mm-hmm. So you hear these things and it has value. Yes. You know, there's some um, in the <laughs> Western world. The dog is the psychopomp animal. That is the animal that meets you when you die and takes you over. That's happened quite a number of times in my Psychomantion project where you take people through this process during which they seem to see and converse with relatives who've died. And I've had quite a number of cases of people who say that uh, their dog appeared in that, which was a signal to them that... Um, that um, you know, this was safe, and uh, and it's also interesting to you know being very compulsive. I have to say that um, in the in the Eastern world, like in like in Siberia and so on, the the psychopomp animal is not the dog, but your horse, since that was a horse based culture, and um, so it's you know that period when we are crossing over to another world, it would make sense that we um, we change our language shifts. And that's what people with near-death experiences tell us, that there just are no words they can use to convey this. But I think that we are on the road now to cracking the code. I really do. Well, there's so much there that we can learn and gain from your um, combined experiences on this topic. And, you know, Dr. Moody, I'd like to ask you a very simple question. And then I've got one for Lisa right after that. (laughs) So I know that you coined the term near-death experience. Mm -hmm. What, What was it that had you coined that term? 
Well, because it was so obvious that uh, there were so many of these experiences. I first heard about this um, not coming from a religious background. The idea of an afterlife, to me, I, I literally thought it was just a joke that for something people had in cartoons. So um, I went to the University of Virginia and immediately fell in love with Plato, literally my my first couple of days at UVA when I was 18 years old. And it was in reading Plato's Republic that I became aware that uh, that the Greek philosophers studied cases of people who were believed <coughs> dead but revived who told these stories. And, I mean, I had a great interest in that. And then three years later in um, 1965, I... I didn't understand that that was still going on in the modern world, but in 1965, I heard the story of Dr. George Ritchie, who was a psychiatry professor at UVA, who had had such an experience, and that got me fascinated with it. So by the time I went to medical school, after after a career as a philosophy professor, I went to medical school in 1972, and I already had a lot of these. So... Um, basically what happened, I was asked to give a lecture on my work in 1970, April of 1973, when I was in medical school, and I had to come up with some word. Well, what I was thinking was perimortal visionary experience, but my, <laughs> my advisor, my, my, um, uh, Russ Moores, who was my wonderful, um, hematology professor, said, no, Raymond, that's too medical. So I thought, and then I, you know, we, if you say death experience, well, they weren't really dead. Um, but we do say that people are near death. So I just said uh, near death experiences. And that's what stuck. Although I'll tell you the truth. I've always thought that's kind of an awkward sounding um, experience, but, but it stuck. And, um, now we know that in addition to near-death experiences, these experiences that take place when people are apparently dead but are revived, we know that identically the same experience takes place to people who are not themselves ill or injured but who happen to be there at the death of someone else. So the bystanders in the shared death experiences, as we call them, talk about uh, as their loved one dies that they themselves get out of their body and go upward toward the light with their dying loved ones and so on and then come back and rejoin their bodies and all these things that we know of as near-death experiences also occur to bystanders and that's why the uh, the communication of the dying in the last few days and hours and minutes of their lives is so important it's um we really have to hold on to this language and figure it out because that's the only, you know, people think they want a rational proof of an afterlife. And I'm beginning to think that that may be impossible in the future. But in the meantime, the, the way forward to, um, to that point is to have some sort of rational understanding of the um, dying words because, see, science as we have it, is based on literal meaning, and uh, you can't put the the dying words of people into the context of literal meaning and make sense of it. So you've got to have a broader perspective on language. And I love and that's that. where Lisa, I think, I mean, her work is just very, very important. Yeah, I think it's so important the work that she's doing, and Lisa from how this dovetails so nicely with this discussion. Yeah, I know you're. You have the final words project. What have we learned so far about some of the final words, and is there any kind of patterns that are associated with them? Yeah, there there are several patterns, and as Raymond said, language shifts in ways that may indicate the pathway of consciousness. So we see language change, and we also see people's perceptions and experience change as they're crossing the threshold. So first of all, in terms of language, the language becomes much more metaphorical. So, you know, the language of science 
aims to be objective. You know, everyone agrees upon this is a cup. And if we wanted to prove the cup, it would be replicable. We could all prove over and over again it's a cup. We all agree it's a cup. But we know in the realm of subjective experience, you know, I might tell you that love is like a river. And you may tell me that love is like a rose. And Raymond might tell me that love is like a candy bar, right? So in terms of subjective experience. Snickers, um, specifically. (laughs) (laughs) But we know that language expresses very different states of being and literal experience. Experience is only one part of being human. And so what's so challenging as we look at the near-death experience and what people go through as the dying process is that you'll see the language starts to shift in ways that seem much more subjective. So someone, um, so one of the patterns we see, and, and this was also written about um, by in the book Final Gifts. Uh, I just wanted to give them credit also for, for this. But people tend to announce some kind of big event, right? Some kind of big event is coming. So someone who um, uh, is a golfer might announce the big golf tournament is coming. And someone who's a dancer may talk about the big dance that's approaching. And it's hard, you, you know, people around may think, oh my God, they're going crazy. The meds, what are they talking about? There's no big golf game coming. But people begin to announce some kind of large event. My father started talking about the big art show. And oftentimes the metaphors people use to announce the big event are closely connected to their life narrative. So it's a very subjective um, filtering of their experience. So uh, one, one gentleman said to his daughter, oh my goodness, I can't believe um, there are so many remodels. There are... <laughs> There are kitchens and kitchens and dinettes to be remodeled. Well, he was a contractor. So when he was announcing to his daughter, he was going somewhere where there were, um, where there were, there was a reality that was based on his subjective experience, his narrative, life narrative. So one of the patterns is that the language shifts and becomes much more metaphoric and it also becomes nonsensical. Sometimes it just doesn't make sense. Uh, my father, for example, said to me, <coughs> Lisa, there's so much so in sorrow. That, yep. that makes no sense. But as Raymond said, when my father said those words, even though it was technically nonsensical, my subjective experience of those words was very meaningful. It was as if he was saying this is a very sad time. Would we, Raymond, I wanted, did you have something to chime in? Yeah, I do. You know, and the the interesting thing about this, too, is that right now, people listening to us, I can guarantee you that a high percentage of the people who are listening to us are saying right on because they have memories of this, too. Once you bring it up in a big group, then lots of people start chiming in their memories of it. It's once somebody brings it to our attention, we can all see that, yeah, the, the dying words of people are, are very, very important. And uh, so it's, um, it's something that touches people very deeply when they start hearing that other people have been through the same thing. And, you know, I think what's so important is when we hear our children say things like there's an invisible rabbit, you know, mommy, there's a rabbit over here and we don't see the rabbit, right? Or, or, you know, or whatever kind of what seems like imaginary or whatever children say to us, we engage in an interaction. We don't discount their language. They don't, we don't discount their experience. And we know that that's really an important part of healthy development of kids And in terms of the language of the threshold, all kinds of language appears. And one of the things I feel passionately about is to engage with that language and uh, not be afraid of it or judge it and to leave um, one's heart and mind open to the possibility that it it is a representative of something sacred happening rather than something scary. Because it can be scary when our loved ones start talking about things that sound different than we're used to. But on the other hand, for some people, it can be very comforting to listen closely. In the case of my dad, he was a complete skeptic. He didn't believe in anything beyond this world. So when he started talking to me about 
angels in the room, I was stunned, but also comforted by the language I heard as he was describing um, the angels that were around him and have come to find out through the Final Words Project and other researchers also talk about this, that there are these takeaway figures that can be angels or people who have died before us, friends or family, who appear bedside often before we die. So not only is it the, the language we're looking at, but we're also looking at the experiences and the perceptions that people have that are expressed their final words Mm -hmm. and it's interesting how some of that can be very small and we think about it later or some can be very dramatic I know when one of my friends passed uh, the nurse that was there said and and, and there's no way that this could have happened the shapes were drawn there's no light source from that side of the house but this big flash of light bright light was in the room Mm -hmm. Yeah, at the time that she passed. And so you get these different experiences that people have and it, it, you, you know, just pay attention. Yes. And yes. And light comes up commonly in the transcripts and the language. People talk about light a lot, which makes sense in so many ways. When you look at the near death experience and just, I mean, for so many reasons, but ab- absolutely. And, and I think part of my passion about this as a linguist and as a poet, and as a daughter, um, is, you know, the more we can keep our, you know, as I mentioned earlier, just be open to the possibility that the language can connect us to something really fascinating that's going on. And, you know, there were, there are other patterns. And one of the patterns that really struck me is something I call the sustained narrative, where someone might start talking about something two weeks before they die that on the surface looks like it makes no sense. So it might be something like, the train, the train tracks aren't working. The train is broken. And then maybe a few days later, the tracks are repaired. The tracks are repaired. And then if you track the language or follow the language, you'll see that suddenly there's a story that is evolving, this narrative. And then suddenly before the person passes, they may say, okay, it's time to go. The train, you know, the train is leaving the station. And to me, it's amazing that when we're at a point where our brains are are you know we're dying so how is it we're holding these narratives over time in those final days or uh, weeks and telling these stories that if you track them over time <coughs> transcripts they unfold in really remarkable ways and and so that's another pattern that, that really has caught my interest in terms of the consciousness one one thing that sort of um uh, shows the the importance of this is um, that there, there's a very profound um, conflict in common sense that holds us back from thinking rationally about some of the most important questions there is, and that is that the reality is that people love nonsense. Um, you know, I was reading in the New York Times a couple of years ago that. Worldwide, Dr. Seuss's books have sold over 600 million copies. And you think of scat singing and um, doo-wop music from my childhood, where the the um, nonsense is the form of nonsense syllables <laughs> like sha na 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 na, and that's counterbalanced with the meaningful parts like get a job. And um, so people love nonsense, but they don't, they cringe when they hear the, the word. And so what needs to happen is people need to acknowledge that nonsense is, is in a way, it, I mean, it's just as important a form of language as literal and figurative. And uh, it's just that we're, we uh, don't see that partly because we just don't like the word, which is so um, ridiculous. I mean, we love nonsense, but we don't like to hear that word. And um, so that's got to change. And once that changes, then we can really get into genuine uh, rational investigation of the afterlife question. That is absolutely has to be uh, done. And by the way, I'm having a book that will be on on my life's work. It's entitled 
Making Sense of Nonsense, and it's going to be published in um, Llewellyn by Llewellyn Publishers, I believe, in um, January is what they're looking forward to. So yeah. I'm really looking forward to that coming out because um, really this is the all, the big change we need to make uh, to really get into the afterlife question as a serious question for rational uh, investigation is that we've got to see that nonsense is is really okay. It's a great uh, mode of language. And people in their dying um, days resort to this alternate mode of language as a way of trying to express what's going on with them. Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne said one time, I know that my... I know that what I'm saying is nonsense, he said, but it's, these are the only words that seem to fit the, um, my feelings. And I, I know many people are uh, all kinds of things. You know, like I've been thinking a lot lately about synesthesia, people with these cross-sense cross um, perceptions who say that when they, um, when they, hear sounds, they see colors along with the sounds, or or vice versa, where somebody hears uh, a, um, oh, sees a color and they hear a sound that goes with it. And I was reading in a recent book on synesthesia about a little boy who would say things like, that sound is red, isn't it? And then first time he saw a rainbow, he said, a song, a song, a song. Wow. And so... Uh, nonsense can sometimes be a a mode of language that people have to resort to to express some of the most important things that go on with them. And, you know, I was trained as a linguist that there's no such thing as bad language. If it exists, it's like a you can't see there's a bad tree or a bad leaf. You know, so there's the idea that maybe English teachers teach prescriptive language, you know, and that's and that's where you say ain't is bad, right? That's that's prescriptive. But what linguists do, what Raymond's talking about, is a descriptive approach to language. And you know, Raymond, um, I remember reading this very early on in, in Raymond's book uh, that's now going to be published, "Making Sense of Nonsense." When I read the manuscript, and what he said is, you know, Chinese is completely unintelligible to you me right or it is to me I should speak myself <laughs> and however it doesn't mean it's a bad language and it also doesn't mean it's nonsensical because once you understand the rules and and what uh and once you understand it as a system um then it then it makes sense and so one of the questions I have is you know what kind of patterns of nonsense appear as people are dying and there are seem to be certain patterns and Raymond's book He's identified many types of nonsense. And when we look at what patterns emerge and what kinds of effects do those patterns have psychologically or spiritually, it, these are really powerful questions. So when you get away from the idea that there's a right language and a wrong language, and just that there's language, language is powerful, right? Language has the ability to, to set us into you know, meditative states, my father was a psychologist, and he had such a, a grasp of language, he could hypnotize himself when he went to the dentist, so he didn't need Novocaine. So language is so powerful that we can, we can create altered states, and my father was able to do it so that his, his, his gum was numb, so he didn't need Novocaine. So we know that language of all kinds is very powerful, and we shouldn't underestimate what it reveals to us about uh, different dimensions, possibly, and certainly different states of mind. Yes, it really has us kind of looking deeper into, you know, not just how we perceive everything, but the world around us as well. I, my gosh, I could talk to you both for hours, obviously. You're, you're such great wealths of information, not just on this topic, but on many others. You know, I'd love for you to share a little bit with us about the University of Heaven. What is that? And I know the two of you have been working on that. Yes. Well, I had wanted for many years to have a forum where I could reach out to people who are seriously interested in these uh, 
questions of life after death and near death experiences, but I have no um, no computer skills. My my last computer, the crank broke off the side a couple of years ago. So <laughs> I am, um, and so um, uh, Lisa is really great at that kind of stuff. So we've created this um, online forum called the University of Heaven dot com where we're conducting seminars uh, with colleagues of ours, for example, who've, uh, medical doctors who've had profound near-death experiences mainly or who have studied them. And we've had a lot of fun with it. And we've, uh, um, so uh, you can reach us at uh, theuniversityofheaven.com and learn all about our programs. We're finishing up one now where... Um, we actually show people how, if you wish, to call up the spirits of the dead. And I know this just sounds so bizarre, but um, uh, in fact, the ancient Greeks had the, these institutions that were known as oracles of the dead, and they had various procedures you could go through where in a waking, fully awake state of consciousness, you would have experiences during which you seem to see and converse with deceased loved ones. And um, to make a long story short, I'd learned about this as a philosophy student and just gradually over a long period of time and studying the archaeological reports <clears throat> on these places and combining that uh, with my knowledge of as, uh, as a medical doctor and psychiatrist of... Um, of altered states of consciousness. We just sort of finally put all this together and, uh, you know, th this works. <laughs> I know it sounds bizarre, but uh, my work on this has been replicated now by numerous um, uh, different investigators. So we've put together a whole program on how to do this, and it's step by step, and we have um, one of the people we interviewed on their way. I took somebody through the the procedure who had lost her son very tragically. And, um, you know, she talks about her experience during this process of seeing and conversing with her son. And, you know, it, although it sounds extraordinary, this is something that was very well known in the West up until recent times. It was used as a um, a grief therapy modality back in the Middle Ages and was very common, but um, sort of got put by the wayside. But we've we've called this back to the modern world, and and it works. You really can <clears throat> go through a procedure. You know, I, I'm a grief counseling is the main thing I do now. I mean, I, that's the last vestige of my clinical practices that I um, do grief work with people and. Um, this has now been taken up. There, one of the standard books of grief therapy tell, tells you how to do this. And uh, always, I hear people say, uh, "If I only had five more minutes." Well, as counterintuitive it may seem, nonetheless, it is true that we have now a fairly reliable method for giving people that five more minutes. Yeah, so the, I think the course, we're still working on it and putting it together, but it uh, should be released about the time that this broadcast, maybe a little later, about August 1st, we should have that. And uh, right, we're getting ready to do the Near Death Experience Summit with 13 different speakers. And uh, again, by the time this broadcast, we'll have just the recorded version of it. But we have some great, great speakers, people have had near death experiences, and then researchers. And it's hosted by Trish Barker, who wrote a wonderful book called Angels in the OR based on her near death experience. Yeah. yeah, Trish is amazing. And I yeah. see also, you know, on the University of Heaven's website, you, you have noted researcher Dr. Kenneth Ring, who oh, yeah. writes a monthly column. So there's so much great information for people to go to and, and really become more involved in educating themselves on this and on the language. So, well, where can our listeners, and why don't you give the, Lisa, why don't you give the website one more time of where our listeners can go to connect with the both of you? Great. Uh, a good start is the universityofheaven.com. 
and it's theuniversityofheaven.com. And then there's also the final word project.org where there's a lot of information about Raymond's nonsense work as well as uh, my work with final words. Well, I can't wait to get my hands on the nonsense book. And when we do, we're going to have to have both of you on. <laughs> so oh, talk about thank you. That. Um, you know, it, this actually makes it possible to, if, if you equip your mind with, um, with, uh, rational principles to enable you to understand nonsense language, then what this does, this can actually interact with near-death experiences. What I'm getting at here is we have a method now where we can prepare people with new rational principles, which help us out in this life too, because um, uh, nonsense is a big factor in life. Very recent, everybody knows that commercial, right? Like, bada book, bada boom is the current mm-hmm. one, but there are, there are lots of those. And um, so norm- normally nonsense <laughs> just passes us by without us noticing it. But once you start noticing it and you realize that there are principles that govern nonsense, just as there are principles that govern literal language, then when subsequently you have a near-death experience, this gives you an entirely new way to articulate it. And um, this is the future, I think, of research into near-death experiences, that now we can actually prepare our minds ahead of time so that we, ha- when we have such an experience, then we will be able to articulate it in a more intelligible um and clear way for every for everybody else. This will partly overcome that difficulty people have no, that no matter how articulate they are, they say that I just can't describe it to you. But now we have a a, a way of, around that, and it's it's. Uh, I've already had one case in which um, uh, that that has been shown, but but more are to come. There there want. This will eventually um, uh, sink in with people. It's already beginning to sink in with people. Um, well, it's such useful information because one day we are all going to cross that threshold, and to be able to have the language that will help us through that process, I think is, you know, there, there's no price for that. Yeah, I, I think that is right. That is right. It's. Um, because that's the main problem people have uh, when they come back from this. They say, I just can't describe it to you. But now we have new ways of giving them um, uh, the, uh, the logical and linguistic means to formulate this and to talk it, about it in a way that brings it closer to the understanding of our common sense um, mentality. So. Well, Lisa and Dr. Moody, I could talk for you both for hours. I mean, it's always such an honor to spend time with you, Lisa. And of course, Dr. Moody, I so um, just love spending this time with you. Well, thank you so much for both being on the show with us here today. It was a great pleasure. Thank you, Marianne. Yes, thank you so much for this time, Marianne. I just really appreciate this. Well, thank you, Dr. Moody and Lisa. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you and, of course, to talk about your work and the University of Heaven. Again, if you'd like to connect with both Lisa and Dr. Raymond, you can at theuniversityofheaven.com. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count.
In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Mary Ann is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Mary Ann will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.